Okay, so we're all set for this final session, which will, in terms of the format, be a little bit different. So we won't have a panorama, but we will have four snapshots by uh, representatives of four of the founding partners. Um, and we will also have closing reflections. And I'm wondering if Tom, ah, there you are, good, good. <laughs> we're all set now, I'm sure we're all set. Um, and I'm afraid we don't have Q&A uh, as part of this session in the interest of time, but please follow up over drinks. Um, so today we have Stephen Pinfield. Um, he's Professor of Information Services Management at the University of Sheffield. We have Don Duhaney at the Welcome Data Labs. We have Ludo Waldman. Center for Science Technology Studies at Leiden, and then we have Christian Herzog at Digital Science. So we'll talk of, about some of the uh, characteristics of the research that could be done under the umbrella of uh, Rory, um, which have been perhaps a little bit implicit in some of the discussions uh, thus far. And we'll also look at some of the tools that are currently being developed within the founding partners and the group of founding partners to help us to better understand some of the dynamics of the science and innovation system that we've also discussed today. And, uh, and as, as I said, we'll close with the closing reflections by Tom Kariuki, Director of Programs at the African Academy of Science. But we'll start with Stephen. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anne. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so when embarking on any major research program, it's important to um, discuss and surface some of the design principles that you are, are working to. It always surprises me how little that's done. So what I'd like to do to, uh, for the next few minutes is to begin to do that in relation to Rory but to emphasize that this is part of an ongoing conversation between the Rory partners, uh, broadly conceived, and also other stakeholders. So this is very much a provisional uh, view of this uh, characterization of our uh, research principles. And I'd like to situate these principles on a schema of the research process itself, with which we'll all be very familiar, from the initial conceptualization of research questions through identification of various different data, gathering of data, uh, its analysis and integration through to reporting and outputs um, and action arising from that. Uh, and the first point I'd like to make in relation to this is that one of the key things informing Rory investigation is this idea of research informing action. That's a real mantra for all of the discussions we've had to date. Now, I should say about some of these things, they actually sound quite simple, but in practice are really difficult to get right. Um, and we're conscious this is one of the most difficult because it involves engagement in translation issues on the part of all uh, the people involved in the research. And very often the incentives that at least those of us who are researchers are acting to often encourage us to stop at the output stage and then not to engage in that translation activity. Um, and that's something that we're very conscious of and that we need to avoid um, here, but rather focus on uh, turning them uh, insights into action. And that involves, I think, a variety of outputs. That's actually criti absolutely critical to what we're aiming to do. So not just peer-reviewed outputs or reports, although those are very important, but also data uh, themselves, tools, and maybe also pilot systems will be outputs of Rory. And that's something that we're very focused on achieving. And early discussions have really uh, pointed to that as being important. Now, all of that points to the beginning of the process and the variety of research questions that we need to address, not just what or when or who type questions, and certainly not questions where it's easy to find out the answers because the data are easily available. It's often very tempting to address those kinds of questions, but also deeper questions about how and why. And that really involves getting at motivations and understanding the richness and complexity of the environments that we are dealing with. The phenomena, the phenomena themselves are extremely complex and multi-layered, and we need to investigate 
a variety of different phenomena, including systems at all sorts of different levels, from the scientific system as a whole, right through to systems within individual funding organizations, for example, as well as processes followed, behaviors, attitudes, uh, and policies. All of these are in play, and that creates complexity in the research investigation. And that also means that a variety of data, data types are absolutely critical here, both structured and unstructured, numerical as well as textual and other sorts of data in between uh, as well. All of these are important, and, but all of them are creating a set of complex challenges we acknowledge. Now, one of the key challenges here is around the governance and ethics of data. Because there's such a wide variety of data that we're dealing with, and some of it quite sensitive, uh, some of it involving personal data, for example, we need to think very carefully about governance. And one of the challenges we've got here, if we are to open up some of the data sets that were discussed in the previous session around decision-making in, say, funder bodies, including what was rejected, as well as what was accepted, then we've got some big governance and ethical issues to deal with, and we're aware of that. So creating a, a safe space for that data to be discussed and analysed is really going to be critical there, and that's one of the strengths of the consortium that we are bringing together. We think that we can begin to address that kind of challenge. Now, all of this points to um, mixed methods research using both quantitative and qualitative frameworks. And that's a spectrum rather than a dichotomy. Um, that's a really important point uh, to make. And one of the key challenges associated with using such a wide range of methods with different logics, uh, deductive, inductive, and abductive are important here. One of the real challenges there is not the conduct of individual research strands, but their real integration in terms of insight. Um, and so some of the challenges we're dealing with we know are really quite knotty methodological challenges. And so we hope to make contributions in that area uh, as well. Now, all of this we're very conscious involves genuine interdisciplinarity. Um, and one of, the, one of the important features of the team we brought together is that we're bringing together researchers with a variety of interests, but also a very, uh, a very wide range of methodological expertises. And that's critical to the way we actually pursue uh, the research. And we're very keen to work with other partners who can bring different um, uh, sets of expertise to bear on these research questions. So interdisciplinarity is absolutely critical in what we're going to do, and so is co-production. Not just talking amongst ourselves as researchers, but also working with practitioners throughout the process of designing, implementing um, the research, as well as uh, uh, understanding the insights that arise uh, from it. Now, the final thing to say is that although I've pictured the research process as a nice, neat uh, cycle, um, we all appreciate that life is messier than that. Um, and um, it's it, it critical, therefore, that we engage in a, uh, a, a, an approach which allows for flexibility, allows for dynamic and opportunistic addressing of research questions, and also involves a big dose of reflexive reflexivity, which is critical, I think, for giving the research credibility as well as leading to important outcomes. So now what I'm going to do is turn to my colleagues who are going to talk about some of the ways in which these principles can be enacted in our research and some of the early work that's been done. Thank you very much. Duhaini, she's a product and partnerships manager at the Welcome Data Labs, and she will talk about Reach, an open source product Welcome is developing to enable researchers and funders to capture the effect of their work beyond citations. Brilliant. Hello, everyone. My name's Dawn, and yep, I work here in Data Labs at Welcome. Um, and this is us, this is us, the Data Labs team, and there are about 15 of us in Data Labs, and we are truly a multidisciplinary team. We have data scientists, we have data engineers, but we also have user researchers, experts in user experience design, as well as data visualization experts. And our mission as Data Labs is to enable responsible data-driven decision-making at Welcome, and also across the research community. And we do this through building data products, 
We do this through supporting data innovation and also through blending technology and social science. One of the big questions that we've been thinking about for a little while is really about how does the research we fund at Welcome translate into policy influence? And it's a question that sort of came to us um, through working with the insights and analysis team here at Welcome and um, as part of, sort of the Welcome Success Framework. And it's really about moving beyond academic citations and really thinking about how does research translate into influence and into practice. And when it's done well, when we can actually really track this, we, we can find some really great outcomes. So this is a bit of a case study from um, some research we funded back in 2002 with the Kenyan Medical Research Institute, who collaborated with Wellcome and Oxford University to investigate um, ca causes of uh, child mortality in Kenya. They produced some guidelines that were then picked up by the World Health Organization and then from the World Health Organization through engagement, those guidelines were then picked up to, and implemented in the Ministry of Health in Kenya. And it's, there is, you can see quite a clear link between the research, um, the guidelines being picked up in government, and then also actual influence, so actually reducing child mortality rates in Kenya. But the big question is, how do we find more of these examples? And this happens in quite a manual way at the moment, or, or in a word of mouth way. We sort of rely on people to report on outcomes of their research. And if we were to actually look at, look at the World Health Organization in their IRIS repository, they published over 200,000 documents. So it, it, is, it is quite an arduous process to begin to really map out how research translates into policy. And for us as a team, this is what we've really been working on, um, using data, digital and machine learning to, to make more effective. So for us, we've created this product, um, Welcome Reach. This is a mock-up of our design, so we're going to be launching an alpha version of it in the next few months. And it really is about exploring the reach of scientific research and policy making. So we scrape policy documents from organisations like the World Health, World Health Organisation, UK Government, NICE, uh, Medicines on Frontier and UNICEF and we match that to publications found in EPMC. And as I've said, this started off as a project for our internal teams within Welcome that we've decided to open source. And for us, we, we thought quite a lot about our mission and the reason why we were, we were doing this and the reason why we were scaling it. And for us, the open source element is, is really important. Um, yes, it's machine learning, but it's, it's about the product, packaging it up as a product for people to use. And our core audience is our researchers and funders who want to capture the effect of their work beyond citations, academic citations, but also to enable people to use, analyze, and build upon the open policy data we provide. We have, so we, we have a large collection of these policy documents from, from all of these organizations. So it's about helping researchers and other people who are interested to begin to analyze these policy papers. So yeah, we're moving for, it's about moving from a manual approach to an academic, uh, to a, to an automatic approach, and I'll talk through some of the steps. So first of all, uh, our machine learning sort of algorithm finds uh, the reference section within uh, policy papers. So looking for, it's looking for headers like references, bibliographies, and then we split it into different sort of sections, <coughs> and then we, we pass it, we section this. So we, we find the author, we find the year, the title, the journal, and then it's a case of matching the title to uh, the titles in, our, in the open EPMC database. So yeah, for us it's about open source and using open data to power this tool. And for us, we've thought a lot about working in partnership with other organizations because a big thing for us has been around accuracy. We've built this for welcome, but if we want to scale it, we need to really think about um, what accuracy is important for other organizations and also to ensure that we're not being biased, um, particularly in areas like, um, I'll, I'll be reinforcing uh, the golden triangle um, and what, <laughs> what, yeah, what levels of accuracy are important for different groups. So we've been working with CIHR who actually have a manual process for doing all of this to begin to test our methods versus their methods. With UK Research and Innovation, we had someone who was seconded to our team for a bit to work on the tool. And we've, we've also been running the tool on some data from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And actually, 
their, their publications are quite a, di they're a different type of publications to us. Um, so it, it's about understanding the differences in topic area also. And as I've said, we're working on releasing an alpha version, but we're also thinking about future feature development. So for instance, a lot of feedback has been around people saying, oh, um, us being picked up in a guideline shows more influence than being picked up in a report. So how do we begin to demonstrate or, or quantify what influence looks like to help users? And the second thing that's been really important to us has been around designing for ethics. So we use machine learning, and no, it's not a facial recognition product, so <laughs> sort of on the face of it, it doesn't look like it could be very scary, but accuracy is important. And even for us, we found that with our tool, short titles are less likely to be picked up than long titles, um, as, as well as some other things. So it, it's really about thinking about what ethics looks like for our product and then mitigating against that. And for me, I really think a lot of challenges and problems in tech are not about tech, it's about humans. And in my experience, it's about really how can we break down silos between tech teams and non-tech teams. And in, our team, in, in, in data labs, we've used some methods to, to begin to look at this. And this is a very, very simple <laughs> method. And it, it's about understanding what our use cases are, but also looking beyond that and saying, how, how could our product be used unintentionally for harm? How could our product be abused? Um, because often when you build something, people often th only think about the, the way in which they intend it to be used. No one really thinks about any misuse cases. You don't design for misuse cases. But it's really about getting teams, engineers, to think about um, uh, vulnerabilities in products and mitigate against them. And as I've said, we're open source. You can check our repo out on GitHub. And for me, I describe myself as a non-tech tech person. And I've sort of made an effort to, to be on GitHub and to meet the engineers where they are and to begin to work through some of these questions uh, and to be involved in the decision making and trade-offs. And I think that's really important. I think more people who are from social science backgrounds who are interested in ethics in tech should then go and meet sort of technical people, data scientists, engineers, where they are, so we can have more of a productive conversations around what, we, what we're building and the implications of what we're building. So my final call to action is to get involved. Um, we blog openly on uh, Medium, Welcome Data Labs. As I said, we're releasing an alpha version of our product, so if you'd like to be involved in testing, my email's here. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. Beyond GitHub. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> so next up is our very own Ludo Wadman, Professor of uh, Quantitative Science Studies at Leiden University, and he'll demonstrate a uh, freely available and interactive web-based tool uh, for visualizing research funding landscapes based on bibliometric, bibliographic data with the goal, one of the goals to support funders uh, in priority setting. Thanks, uh, Sarah, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So what I would like to do in the next few minutes, I would indeed like to give you a demonstration. Um, hmm. uh, it's a keyboard. Uh, I would like to give you a demonstration of uh, something that uh, we have been working on in, 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 in uh, basically the uh, Rory collaboration, the four founding partners, something we have been working on during the past two months together to build something that gives a kind of concrete example of what is possible. Uh, we had just two months, so time was a bit limited. Uh, it's really just a kind of, uh, of uh, pilot project, but hopefully it gives an idea of the, of the possibilities we have by working together as funders, as, as, as research centers, as technologists. So that's the idea of this, uh, this, this uh, showcase. Um, yeah, so it's about priority setting. Priority setting in science. Um, so for funders, this is of course about basically making choices, choices about the research that you want to support and also the research that cannot be supported given the limited resources that we have. Um, so as you all know, um, questions are increasingly uh, raised about alignment between uh, research priorities and societal needs. So we will focus in this, in this uh, case study, we will focus on health research. And in the health domain, of course, uh, an obvious question is whether research is focused on uh, the most pressing health issues. 
so for instance, on the diseases, the diseases with the largest disease burden. So I'm going to show you something, this graph, which I took from a report that was already mentioned a few times today, the report by uh, Richard Jones and James Wilston, the Biomedical Bubble, published last year. So this is a graph that shows uh, the relationship for a number of diseases between, on the one hand, um, mm, the uh, disease burden, the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis, the, um, um, the amount of research that is done or the amount of funding that is invested in, in, in research. This is, by the way, for the UK. So what we see in this graph, we see that there's only a limited alignment between disease burden and, and um, uh, research funding that is made available. You sh will see, and many of you are probably aware of that, you will see similar figures when you do this at a global scale, these types of analysis. Um, and this, of course, yields difficult questions, difficult questions about, indeed, priority setting. So is, indeed, the funding that is invested in, in health research, is it invested in the best possible way? Do we, indeed, make the right decisions? Do we focus, for instance, on the right uh, diseases? So in the biomedical bubble report, many of you have probably uh, read the report, so the argument is made that um, more, uh, more resources should be made available for uh, research on social, behavioral, and environmental uh, aspects of, of, of health research. So that's based on a quite extensive analysis, but partly it's based on these types of, uh, of quantitative uh, analysis to support prior priority setting. What we are going to do in the, in the tool that I'm going to demonstrate to you is to provide additional data that can be used to support discussions about priority setting, and in particular, discussions in the health domain. This is um, what we call a research landscape. A research landscape, research funding landscape, in this case, focused on health research. What we see is um, um, we see research fields. Each bubble in this in this landscape is a research uh, a research field. It's a few thousand publications taken from the Dimensions database. Uh, these publications are all linked to each other by citation links. They are densely connected. Uh, the fields that are big, the big bubbles, these are fields with many publications. The smaller ones have, have just a, s a smaller number of publications. Fields that are close to each other, they um, tend to be strongly linked by citation links. Fields that are further away, they, they don't have a strong relationship. The color of the fields in this case is the proportion of publications that are indexed in PubMed. So that's a kind of indicator of uh, the extent to which this is really core health research. So the yellow fields in the center, that's the core of the health sciences. The blue ones, for instance, they are more in the periphery. And as you can see, we have manually labeled all these, uh, this, this, this landscape to basically indicate at a high level the structure of, 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 of the landscape. So now, suppose you are a research funder and you need to make decisions about how to um, allocate your funding. Then this research landscape might offer you some helpful information to support your decision making. Suppose we are interested in mental health research, for instance. Suppose a funder, let's say Wellcome Trust, would like to invest additional um, money in health, uh, mental health research. This landscape now shows where actually mental health research is being done within the overall landscape of health research. Um, so it's, it's similar to the previous visualization, but we now see for each field, we see the number of publications that are addressing mental health diseases. So we have made a link between publications, mental health diseases, and now we see the big bubbles. These are the fields where a lot of mental health research is done. So this means that as a funder, you can start to think about which of those fields you may want to prioritize. So perhaps these should be the fields in the center of the map, the fields that actually take a kind of focus on genetics approaches to, uh, to uh, mental health diseases. It might also be the fields in the bottom left, which take a focus much more on, on uh, behavioral approaches to, to mental health issues. This is something that funders can start to uh, discuss based on such landscapes. Funders can also compare where they are currently positioned, where the publications they have funded are located in such a landscape, for instance, the mental health publications, and how this compares to other, other funders. 
I'm not going to show you how to do that because you can do it yourself. The landscape is available on the Rory website. Um, you can just go there. Um, yeah, it even works with your mobile phone. We just, half an hour ago, <laughs> we fixed the, f the, the last bugs. So it should work on your mobile phone. Uh, you can go to the website. You can take a look at the landscape uh, yourself. For the 100 largest funders, largest in terms of publications, um, data is provided. And you can see where they are located in the health, la health science landscape or the overall landscape of science. So I hope that this shows um, possibilities that we have by working with scientometric data, scientometric tools, combining this with expert knowledge. In this case, we got support from experts at Wellcome Trust. So possibilities for having, let's say, more informed discussions about priority setting. And in the end, our hope is that this could be a first step towards a research program, a Rory research program on priority setting. This would be a research program that, uh, let's say, takes a broader, uh, a, a broader set of uh, approaches into account along the lines that Stephen already uh, presented, quantitative, qualitative approaches. That was not possible in the, in the two months that we had for this, this uh, first uh, prototype. Um, but that's the longer term ambition that we have in, 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 in Rory. This is the team that worked on the, on the tool that, uh, that, that, uh, that I have shown to you and that's available to all of you. Uh, the team at Wellcom and at, uh, at CWTS. I also want to mention the digital science team that also uh, provided support for this. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Ludo. And now for the final snapshot, we'll move to Christian Herzog, Chief Port Portfolio Officer mm. at Digital Science. Out of Digital Science. Yes. Yeah. So he'll talk to us on the types of partnerships developed through dimensions uh, since the launch of the database, and we'll share some results from collaborative work they've been doing recently. Yes. Um, uh, thank you, everybody. I think I'm the last one before we have the closing notes. Um, I did an experiment, and I figured out that I have eight minutes instead of five running a stopwatch. But this is as far as it will get <laughs> in terms of that, scientific experiment in my uh, <laughs> talk, since I'm in the end only a medical doctor, and I need just to walk you through facts. And let me uh, start <laughs> in the past. When we started at Digital Science to work on dimensions, the large um, research information infrastructure around 2016, we, of course, determined why we did it. And we established that we want to bring down barriers to make secondary data, like publications and citations, more and more openly available and accessible, especially for individual researchers. We wanted to broaden the view to get beyond the publication citation dogma and include grants, policy documents, patents, and clinical trials systematically. We actually wanted to work towards enabling the research community um, by providing a research data infrastructure so that the community can develop and own indicators which are used for uh, assessment. And um, uh, one of the most important things we wanted to realize and trigger innovation, not only by digital science, by also forcing our market companions to think about how they evolve going forward. In 2017, to move forward, it was just working relatively boring, but a lot was happening. Six digital science companies and groups worked together to realize dimensions, but not alone, with more than 100 development partners around the globe, research organizations and funders, um, and a lot of them are also today in the room. Then. 2018, just next door in January um, on the 15th, we launched Dimensions, uh, and today it provides access to 103 million publication records. And I wanted to stay a little, a little bit on this one since the question about data for research was mentioned a couple times during the day. 100 million publications with 1.1 billion citations, then a 5 million grants database, and 1.6 trillion in funding, and clinical trials policy documents, um, 39 million patents, but the documents are one thing. But what we really were driven by and are passionate about is that we work very hard on indexing and mining the relationships between the different uh, document types so that we, for example, have 12 million links between uh, a publication and a specific grant and 18 million links between a publication and a funder 
or uh, approximately 1 million pointing from publications to clinical trials and more than 300,000 into the other direction. Because the direction matters and actually these links allow you to follow the trajectory of research um, from funding to output to impact. It's never going to be complete, but um, uh, uh, it is a basis to work from. And so we started in 2018 to make that data available. Uh, for scientometric research purposes to individual researchers at no cost in order to bring down the barriers to actually perform this type of research. And we did this together, experience how we can do this and have started so far more than 80 projects um, and also started to work with research groups in a more collaborative setting, providing them bulk data access so that they can work with a large scale analysis on the data. But obviously, these approaches were limited by our size of the team. We cannot work with everybody, so we needed to work uh, towards achieving scale. And uh, just a few weeks ago at the ISSI conference in Rome, we um, launched a partnership that we basically work with ISSI so that they can decide who of their members should be able to access the data. And we actually take ourselves as digital science as much as we can out of this process in order to achieve scale and provide more researchers with access uh, to the data. And today, uh, the launch of Rory obviously um, uh, marks a qualitative change um, because it's no longer us only providing data, um, but we have now a collaborative setting where with our capabilities, want of course to contribute data, but also provide, take part in the interpretation and the research activities as much as we can, aligned with the Rory objectives of research, translation, innovation, brokerage, and be facilitating. So what we are going to do is we are making for the Rory members the data and the tools available, including the API, and um, things which are currently in development, for example, a machine learning based uh, classification uh, using the units of assessment or the uh, global uh, sustainable development goals, uh, which, will, uh, which we are working on with academic partners at this point, and of course, support from the broader digital science team. And Ludo just mentioned, um, uh, this is also a collaboration where um, uh, digital science with dimensions mining the acknowledgement sections of approximately 75 million uh, full text records for the mentioning of funders or projects in order to enable then the map which allows you to place the funders and their activities uh, on uh, the landscape. One um, a glimpse into what we are going to do um, uh, or currently working on as a forthcoming uh, a report in the Rory context um, where we are looking at the international collaboration and the connectedness, not only in terms of number of outputs, but also taking an algorithm, and now it gets too complicated for me, so for specifics you need to add Don, uh, Daniel Hook uh, afterwards, which takes into account, um, uh, similar to a Google PageRank, the, over the main um, uh, collaborator in a specific country and how connected they are. And what you clearly can see that not only on an output level, but also taking this more complex view into account that uh, China is clearly on the rise while the others have maintained their level of attractivity. So just trying to connect um, 2016 to today and hopefully Rory will exist still after 2050. But um, bringing down the barriers, um, and making the data more available, this is clearly one of the goals of Rory um, and uh, the example of also then providing tools um, which are openly available is fully aligned with what we wanted to achieve in 2016. Broadening the view, of course we broadening the view in order to gather data and mind the relationship is one thing, but then you need to look at it to broaden the view and that is what Rory is about. Enable the research community, the data is available and we have seen already in individual projects um, uh, indicators being developed on a small scale, but we hope that Rory and the projects developing within Rory will actually bring that to scale as well and uh, triggering innovation. If that would be not one goal, why would we be here? Thank you. Um, may I now invite Tom Karayuki, Director of Programs at the African Academy of Science, to the front for closing reflections.
Do you need to be hooked on to the screen? Yeah. No? Yeah. I think we have, we have seen enough of slides, so I will... Uh, <laughs> So I, I just want to, to offer some reflection, but in doing so also, um, I think bring some perspectives from um, some of the learnings and lessons we are seeing from, from engaging with African researchers across the continent on many of the issues that have been part of the, the program today. I think the challenge for us um, is that, um, you know, it's, it's a huge continent. Um, it's huge disease burdens across the continent of Africa. It's a very large constituency to operate. We are representing more than 2,200 ethnic groups. There's huge scientific, economic, and cultural diversities across the continent. There is huge challenges of attracting, retaining, rewarding scientists to stay on the continent. And, and I think all, all of this means that, uh, you know, retaining the best people to work on, on major health and developmental challenges is a challenge in itself. So I was looking at some of the data talking about the number of scientists in Germany, in the UK, PhDs, and I was like, wow. Because, you know, in Africa we need, just to get to the global averages of about 800 scientists per million inhabitants, we need to train a million PhDs. Because at the moment, it, it, you know, just by way of comparisons, the UK has 4,500 scientists per million inhabitants. In Africa, that number is about 198, uh, less than 200. But that's also an opportunity, because there's an opportunity for us to do, you know, to train, there's an opportunity to harness the vibrancy of the un youngest population in the world. There is an opportunity to avoid the mistakes made by older democracies and more established centers. Um, there is opportunity to experiment with a combination of indigenous knowledge systems combined with some of the, you know, the modern approaches. Uh, there's opportunity to leapfrog with new dig digital technologies like I have seen today uh, being presented here. Uh, opportunities for increased productivity and to unlock opportunities to unlock more funding from domestic sources and from governments is something we keep uh, engaging with. So our theory of change is, is really to look at how we drive a sharp focus on scientific excellence and quality. And yes, we do indeed need to make the distinction between excellence and quality. Uh, training the next generation of, 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 of researchers on the continent looking at issues around scientific engagement, uh, citizenship. Uh, how we engage with policies with the general public, uh, looking at how communities um, uh, can be uh, engaged better, and then, st then the strengthening of the research cultures and the research environments is something that we include as part of our theory of change for a lot of the, th the work we do. So we've, been, we've had, at the African Academy of Sciences, 30 years of reflection around what needs to happen in Africa. It's been a journey of up and downs, boom and bust sometimes, but in the last four years or five years, we need a huge acceleration with the support we have received from our global partners like Welcome and, and others to really focus on areas allowed, good research, uh, leadership development, mentorship, etc. So we, we want to understand that in, in, in crafting how we move forward, and, and thank you Rory and the team here for really bringing up these discussions, that we understand the, the, the aspect around how do we build excellent science, but in Africa and other places in the global south, we also want to build excellence. So you can fund excellent science, but I'm not quite sure how we then work to build excellence. And that's a key question for us because it's, an, it's a fine balance between funding excellence, building excellence, achieving equity, given the diversity, for example, of the continent we work in, and given the need to deliver as we have had throughout the day, impact delivered much quicker than we have done before. So we know there are brilliant researchers everywhere, and we know through the calls we make uh, at, at the academy that we get very good ideas from all over. So we experiment with things like the consortium approach to address some of these challenges. But there is a research question here. What is the right size of a productive research consortium? I don't know what the right size is. Maybe Rory has an answer with regard to what <laughs> a productive research consortium uh, is. I've heard a lot about data today, and, and I wanted to, to, to bring a, a, a bit of, uh, uh, you know, um, thinking around this, because I know we are dealing with data that is being held by funders, data that is be, uh, we want to share across board. Every time we convene African researchers, I hear a lot about data, and what I hear mostly is hesitancy to share data, sometimes bordering on resistance to share data. I think there's a bigger conversations that we need to have because 
we can't move forward if we are not going to include any, everybody in that discussion. And if there is hesitancy and resistance to share, what are the things that are preventing people from wanting to share data? Yes, we know we are producing data. Yes, we know we need to upload that data. How do we actually get to share that data so that it can help us make all the good decisions we need to make? So we talk about shifting the center of gravity, and that means that you know, as we do this, we are looking at data from all the key priority areas, whether it's genomics, climate change, data sciences, clinical research, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what I think what I've heard mostly is a number of things, and I want to share with you a few examples on, 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 on the concerns that uh, I'm hearing. One is, for example, the question of around data ownership versus custodianship. So ownership, according to many African scientists, is, is ill-defined or, or ill-suited to define stakeholders' responsibilities. So, so and, and I think the, the broader concept of custodianship, which is implying caretaking, uh, governance responsibilities uh, for the data community, fair and transparent practices based on not rather strictly legal terms, but also but looking at how we protect participants and, and communities. I would like to hear more about community engagement and how communities benefit from everything that we do. And this should be an integral part of, of the planning and implementation and how we want to engage uh, local communities that are involved in research. I think that the key issue here is, is that we need to move from the notion of doing research on communities to doing research with communities. Uh, so where, where they are empowered and they are able to contribute to the discussions and, and to decision-making processes. <clears throat> and so it brings the question, and I'm just giving one example from, for example, what I've heard about the, the clinical data, for example. It brings questions around informed consent and respect for autonomy. And these, again, are, are complex issues around informed consent, respect for persons. That is a universal uh, principle. But what we have is that we have research that shows that the application of this principle varies widely from context to context. And again, giving examples from Africa, where you have culture and unique values uh, that are quite diverse, div div uh, diverse, yes. What we need is informed concept that is preceded by very deliberate efforts uh, to understand and appreciate the, the cultural context and the local values, because otherwise then it, it becomes futile. So I, again, this is tied to how we deal with ethics issues, how we deal with institutional boards, and their role. The, the, there's a question around, for example, <clears throat> a push that is being seen to be driven from external to the continent around the balance between broad versus dynamic versus tiered consent. Broad, so where stakeholders say, you know, participants data or biological sample reuse, th these things, it makes African researchers very, very uh, apprehensive about who owns the data, where will the data end, what are the benefits to me, what are the benefits to the community. So we need research that tells us whether participants would be better served by a dynamic model rather than a broad and limited model, where we incorporate follow-up and allow oversight of some kind to, to continuously be part of that discussion. So there's a question also around research integrity and conflict of interest, which I think has also been brought to our attention, which is where Researchers sometimes feel that we need to maintain a healthy balance between funders and ethics and consent protocols. And, and so that the funders are not influencing, for example, um, you know, where you have issues around, we are funding you, there are constraints in the global south for money, therefore who pays the piper calls the tune, is that the expression? And therefore, that creates very unhealthy relationships, and I think we need to be aware of, of that. One area for me that I think is, is quite sensitive is the whole issue around responsible and, and culturally sensitive reporting and dissemination of findings. So the unfortunate scenario is that um, we still have a lot of what you might call uneducated, insens insensitive, inappropriate, and inaccurate reporting about populations. African populations, marginalized populations. And this is commonplace, it has been commonplace for decades. And it still persists, unfortunately. So we need to start thinking about clear guidelines, which must be developed in, the, in, in consultation with, with, with stakeholders to ensure that we are, we are not actually, or we, we are not causing personal, community, and population level harms through unnecessary reporting 
and, and, and targeting of, of various communities. For example, you know, we, I think it should avoid non-essential descriptions of race or ancestry in publications, unless that is, uh, that is important, um, unless it contributes materially to the method or findings or discussions. <coughs> So at the academy, we prefer, for example, that study participants or certain groups are referred to as Northland, Southland, Central, Eastern Africans, um, or by their country or origin, unless there's a reason why you want to demarcate them into Tusis and Hutis and Africanas and Kikuyus and whatever else. But there, there, there is a place for that. But consistently, we find that these are issues that we need to, to all be aware of. And then, as you are already aware, we have a crisis currently going on in the DRC Congo. So we need to be aware of what kind of research and how do we behave during a crisis. And so during times of crisis, what we find obviously is that local communities should, uh, you know, should be involved in, in shaping the research and to differentiate between research and treatment. If a group of people wearing lab coats walks into a village, the, the, the people there will start immediately to think they have come to provide us with treatment. So if you're just collecting data and you're not providing treatment, then you already are going to face serious challenges with dealing with those communities. So, and I think that it is quite telling what is happening in places like the DRC Congo right now, where we see all these all these challenges. So, we need to think we need to think research around differential ethics. So, there is ethics you apply during normal times, and there are ethics which you apply during a crisis. But we need better grounding and better data to tell us when we apply these differential ethics as we move forward. So, all of this means there is. There are questions around protecting bioresources, there are questions around biobanking of samples, there are questions about, about data provenance that we need to, to, to actually address. I'm not saying this is just a job for Rory, but I guess Rory has his work cut out. <laughs> <laughs> there are data-driven decisions, and I've heard a lot uh, that I think is, you know, resonates with me and resonates with, with my organization. Again, like I've said, the balance between equity, gender inclusivity. One of the biases, I think being aware of biases and unconscious biases, issues around stereotypes, gender. There are questions around should we fund clinical research in Africa only or should we fund discovery research somewhere else? So, so there are people who think, for example, that you know, we should be funding certain research some places and not other kinds of research, and certain research are only better done in some other places. And so these are, these are all sensitive issues, and, but we need to be aware of them. So in terms of careers, I think that um, one of the things I would really like to hear and to see more of is a diversity that reflects intergenerational conversations. Uh, I think too often, you know, the next generation of leaders, we talk a lot about that. So who will be leading science globally 10, 15, 20 years time? When we talk about the future, our young people in the room, because otherwise whose future are we talking about? And so, too many, many of us go to these kind of meetings and you are left wondering, so whose future are we talking about here? So we need new voices uh, across all the global forums, uh, across geographies, across cultural diversity, across gender, ordinary citizens need to be represented. I, I think cultural diversity is an important one because these things need to reflect the fact that there is an emerging, you know, players, key players in Africa, in Asia, and in the global south. And too, too often, there is not enough representation uh, from those regions. So there should be more transparency about membership to various global forums, ag about priorities. And I think it should go beyond tokenism. I receive a lot of emails, and you can read between the, the lines. Somebody convened a meeting somewhere, and they assembled their first meeting, and they suddenly realized we don't have enough diversity in this group. <laughs> and then they draft an email to say, would you like to, be, to represent the African uh, <laughs> institutions in this forum. That is tokenism, and I think we need to all say, we don't need that. So, one of the things that Ronnie, I think, should do immediately is to say, we, they will advocate for respect for law of diversity in its many forms, uh, so that we see, because we see prejudices everywhere against uh, all these things, whether it is funding decisions or, or, or elsewhere. We can learn a lot from interdisciplinary approaches and problem solving. And the bigger narrative around decolonizing scientific methodologies is something I have had in many forums in Africa. Again, it was alluded to here, definitions of excellence, how we deliver research, how we embrace open science that benefits everyone, how we design programs, how we recruit research teams, interdisciplinarity, support for co-creation approaches, 
uh, that engage communities and how we banish the tyranny of impact factors. <laughs> All of that are part of the decolonization agenda, which I think we, we all need to, to do. I think finally, um, is to say, I think that uh, we, we, we're really happy to, as, as the African Academy of Sciences and Partners in Africa, to be part of this initiative. Um, but more importantly, I think, I think the challenge for all of us is, do we just want to close the gaps? Or more importantly, should, it, should we be about challenging uh, existing models, or a bit of both. Um, science generates knowledge, science generates power. Power is supposed to, you know, all of this is supposed to be the source of truth, and they say truth sets us free. But actually, if you think about it, um, in, in, the, in the age of science deniers and haters and demagogues who, who want to take us backwards, is science setting us free? Um, there's a lot of work here. I mean, just two examples to finish with, so climate change. So we've had data on global warming for 20 years, demonstrating that our planet is headed in the wrong direction. Uh, many decision makers remain unconvinced. Uh, we are still debating about the cost correction that we need to do to save ourselves as a species and save our planet. And the other example is vaccines, of course. Uh, and in Africa, we are very passionate about vaccines. <coughs> vaccines have saved millions of lives uh, across the globe. So many people are alive today who would not be alive if there was not for vaccines. But we have vaccine deniers, and we have communities who resist vaccines from London to New York to Goma City in the DRC Congo. And by the way, congratulations to Welcome for a very good report, the Welcome uh, Vaccine Monitor Report that was uh, released recently. So we welcome the partnership with Ori to generate the data that helps us uh, to craft new paths and uh, to reinforce what I think is our basic scientific and, and human values uh, as a community and as a scientific enterprise. So thank you for the invitation and thank you for your attention. That was uh, fantastic. Obviously, we don't want to send you all away by actually um, expressing our great gratitude for participating, not only the presenters and the panelists, but also you in the audience and everyone on social media. And Jonetta will say a final word in a minute. Let me close by saying that clearly trying to answer all of the questions and issues that were put on the table today um, that will be a daunting task. Uh, we are acutely aware that we should avoid quick technological fixes, that the answer is not only to collect more and bigger, bigger, bigger data. Um, that will not solve all of our problems. So with Rory, we really try to be more realistic than that. And at the same time, put in the hard work of challenging some of those existing models. Thank you for that. And of making explicit what we think worked and what didn't work and do that as funders, as academic, as research intelligence providers, and hopefully other strategic partners. Um, and then to also empirically test it and evaluate what worked and what failed, and then try that again. So this will take time, but we really look forward to trying to fact change that way. Over to you. So, just very, very quickly, just delighted and was thrilled to hear all of the energy and the fantastic questions, as well as all of the challenge. And please do keep that coming to let us know what your ideas are. We'd love to hear from you. I have to end by thanking some really important people, and I hope you'll join me in doing that. Mary Watson, who is the conference organizer and our catering and AAV team. As you know, it's not possible without people like that who are in the background, and she's just an amazing job. I need to acknowledge Adam Dinsmore. A lot of you have at least gotten probably loads of emails, and perhaps maybe he's in your spam box. Um, but Adam does have a day job, but I just wanted to please join me in thanking me, um, Adam for organizing. And there are loads of people who uh, worked really tirelessly, and I'm not going to go through the army because there truly is an army of people behind this, but I do want to acknowledge Julia Giddings, Katie Alexander, Alex Jackson, Liz Adelanwa, and Simon Shears who really, really worked 
really, I think, in through midnight last night to try to get the website and the tools and everything ready for uh, today. So please uh, join me in thanking them. Um, and lastly, I don't want to single one person out, but I am going to single one person out, and that's James Wilsden who has just done an amazing, amazing job, I hope you'll agree, with putting this program together, and, and also who's put in um, a lot of, lot of thinking and time to develop the program, the papers, um, a lot of the content, and has really prodded the rest of us to pull this together. As you know, this, the work's just starting, um, but we're thrilled to be able to be here. So on behalf of James and Sarah and Daniel and myself, please join us for Drinks Next Door. We hope you'll stay around. Thank you. Thank you.